Hello, my name is Tammy Bean and I'm going to do a demonstration of early southeastern Indian pottery. Here in Alabama we have one of the best collections I've seen at our Alabama archives. A lot of the pictures behind me are from there and I encourage everybody to take a field trip, go see our Alabama pottery at the archives. And I guess I'll start at the beginning. It's like, uh, what are pots made out of? And it's basically just mud out of the ground, clay, riverbanks, road cuts, creeks. I know pretty much probably everybody's played in the mud down at the river or the lake, uh, probably out in your garden or even your driveway. You get underneath the topsoil, you hit clay in Alabama just about everywhere. And it's free and it's abundant. And that's what they used to make all their beautiful dishes. So many beautiful forms, so many different colors. It can come from red to white to a kind of a yellowy color. Uh, and every color in between that. Uh, we've got one of the most diverse color things all across the state. Uh, and like I said, it's a free natural resource and that's what they used to make the pottery out of. When you bring clay in, you can either bring it in wet and use it like that, or you can bring it in dry like this and just kind of crush it up to about thumb size. And if you do that, you just pour it in a bucket and just let it set. And like I said, it comes in all different colors. The color really doesn't matter on making pots. Uh, the darker red it is, it seems like it's not quite as plastic. It's got a higher iron, iron content to it, but it still works good on a lot of it. Uh, it's just trial and error. Um, but this is just an idea of uh, the different colors. This is clay that I brought in, put in buckets. I let it set and it'll just turn to mush if it's dry like this. Um, then I let the water settle to the top, and when it gets to the top, I'll pour it off and let it just sit there until it's kind of a thick pudding consistency. And then I'll pour it out on, I used to use feed sacks, I use pillowcases now, but I'll pour it out and kind of smear it around while it's really goopy and let it set out in the sun. And after, oh, I don't know, about every hour or so, I'll go out and I'll just fold it over until uh, it gets good and dry, kind of evenly all the way through. And... When you get done, pretty much you can just beat it up into a block of clay like you'd go by. Other than, like I said, this is a free natural resource. And this is what they made all the pots out of in the southeast for, geez, thousands of years. It's really kind of fascinating. This is one of my favorite topics that uh, still fascinates me today, and I've made a lot of pots. Some of the earliest pottery in the southeast starts about 4,500 years ago at a little place called Stalin's Island. It's in between Georgia and South Carolina. And they did what they called fiber temper. And temper is nothing more than what they mixed in with their clay uh, just to keep it from shrinking so much. <coughs> and fiber temper actually burns completely out, but they would take Spanish mollusks or grasses, whatever they had, mix it in with the clay, and then you'd have this really basically lump of uh, fibrous clay, and they'd beat it out into like a bowl shape that they could actually use. As time goes on, you get a little more refined and you get some punk tape decorations, but they're still kind of clunky, ugly pots. And uh, the fiber burns out, but it keeps your clay from shrinking as it dries. I know y'all have probably seen mud puddles when they start to dry out, they'll crack and craze, and that's just from the clay shrinking. That's just the natural thing, clay shrinks. Um, you've probably heard of chink and log cabins how they'd mix straw and uh, grasses in with the clay, pack it between the cracks of the logs to keep it from shrinking and falling out. It's that same principle. You also get into woodland time period. Uh, where, down where y'all are in South Alabama, you get a lot of sand. I'm from North Alabama, we get limestone that is ground up and mixed in with the clay. But you get a lot of uh, cone-shaped pots, woodland time period, some with little podal feet on them. Yep would just be fake, not really setting. But this shape is really good for setting in a fire and cooking in it. And this pot we've cooked in quite a bit and it's great. It just nestles right in between the logs um, when you're cooking. Uh, it cooks real evenly. Uh, just a good little cooking pot. Not real good outside the fire. It gets really awkward outside the fire. Another thing, woodland time period, you start seeing a lot of fabrics uh, pressed in on the clay. And they had really fine fine fabrics early on. Some of the earliest fabric in the southeast is from the Winover site down in Florida 
and it's almost like a linen. It's so fine. We're talking advanced technology uh, with fabric, with clay, with stone. There's nothing uh, primitive or anything. I mean, we're talking really nice craftsmanship on everything. But you'll see the fabrics pressed into the clay. I've seen really almost lacy salvage edges. I've seen um, patches sewn on pieces of cloth. Uh, just some really fine stuff. This is a shirt of a little bit uh, wider. I don't know if you can see it too much on the video here, but here's a real shirt of some that's got some fabric pressed in it. It's just a fascinating thing. It's not just uh, clay tells you one story. Uh, the pots and stuff can tell other stories as you go on through uh, looking at them. Different areas, different time periods, there's so much that pottery can tell you. Um, Mississippian time period, they go to mussel shell temper. And that's what you get a lot of down here, like 500 to 1,000 years ago, up through historic time period. And they take freshwater mussels. This is just, you imagine it had another side to it, like a clam. And they would burn them. And after you burn them, they just crush really easy. You can crush them with your hands. And then they would sift it out to whatever size they needed. If they were doing a cooking pot, like this one over here, um, this has got shell temper around the bottom. But um, if they're doing a cooking pot, they would do great big pieces in it. And the reason for that is when you get to this type temper, not only does it keep the clay from shrinking, once this is burned, it uh, expands all it's ever going to. And then when you actually cook in the pot, that heating and contracting every time you cook in it and cool it, this doesn't budge, it just stays the same. So it kind of cushions that effect. So you'll find cooking type vessels with really thick, heavily tempered so they can take a lot of heat shock. Um, if you're going for like uh, water bottles, <clears throat> most of those are what they call kind of a bell plane, but they'll sift out the little, little bitty tiny pieces of it and uh, mix it in the clay almost really fine. So this has got little tiny pieces mixed in it. It makes a denser, uh, more probably uh, watertight pot. And all the clay, even though you fired it and everything, you can cook in them, uh, this will hold water, but it'll still seep because nothing's glazed, but it'll keep the water cooler too with it. But that's one thing that's kind of fascinating. Temper is one thing that uh, archeologists use to type and date pottery, depending on what area and what time period you're in. Um, and temper is just basically what they mixed in their clay. It's just an inclusion in the clay with the main part of it. And I'm gonna sit this out of the way. Start a pot here for the demonstration part of it. Um, in the ethnographic accounts with the Cherokee and the Choctaw, they're using a bowl and a, just a piece of cloth to cover it. And this works great. Um, it's just, I don't know why it surprises me because they did it for several thousand years, uh, with the first pottery coming in about 4,500 years ago, probably takes about another thousand for it to trickle over into Alabama, but still, you were talking a couple thousand years with it. But basically, you want to start off with a pancake, and this one I kind of rolled out to get it good and flat. You just want to kind of work it down in the bowl. So let's clear it out of the way. After you do that, then you'll start adding coils. And there's no right way or wrong way to do coils. I like to just kind of squish them out. But some people can roll a really nice coil. Uh, this is just what I'm used to doing. And you're going to uh, paddle it and do a lot of other stuff to it. So I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to roll the perfect coil. Because I know I'm going to be basically squishing and doing a lot of stuff to it. But after you do that, 
<clears throat> you just start it on here, work it around like a big snake. And I'm laying it, I don't know if you can see this, I'll just get it over a little bit more. I'm laying it kind of like layered up where it's got like the base and then I'm laying the coil on top of that. So there's a, a layered kind of thing and I'm not putting it just on top of it. And that gives you a little bit extra security on keeping it on there. You just want to kind of put it together on the outside all the way around and this is just that gap where I'm putting the coil on I'm just making it basically one just smearing it together you want to kind of just squish it down on the Good and tight. And then I'm going to take my thumb and I'm trying to think where you can see. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to smear it together with just one, two. I'm on the inside of this. And I do that all the way around so it's stuck together really good. And you want to do it when the coils are kind of the same consistency. If you let a coil dry out too much then try to put it on, uh, you'll end up getting cracks at the junction. So you want to make sure they're kind of the same consistency and not too dry. After you do that, you can kind of shift it in the bowl. But then I'm going to bring it up and kind of just squish it straight up and kind of get it in the, the area I want to go, kind of that shape of the, the rounded pots. And um, what I'm going to make is, I guess I should say what I'm going to make, is like a cazuela. Um, here's a picture from 1898. Uh, it's from Oklahoma, two creek ladies. And if you notice the bowls, that's like a really typical southeastern shape. Archaeologists call them Cazuela bowls. You see it Mississippian all the way through historic time period. And this like survived the Trail of Tears. Uh, they were this, like I said, this picture's taken in Oklahoma. And that's what I'm going to do is a Cazuela. And they come in all sizes too. You get uh, larger ones. You get smaller ones. Um, you get a most personal eating size ones. Uh, this is a shirt off of a real one, which would have been a huge, probably communal serving dish. Uh, you get all kinds of sizes coming off of them. But it's a real standard, standard size bowl or standard style of bowl with all kinds of decorations that you can put on them. Mainly the decorations on most part is just incised around the top of it, on that top neck. kind of see that shape taking shape here
and now I got it <clears throat> kind of in shape going here and pretty much everybody will say uh, that's ugly they kind of go through this ugly duckling stage and when you're teaching pottery this is pretty much where everybody gets frustrated with it and it's just kind of like uh, this doesn't look good kind of thing but you have to stay with it I've got a pottery pottery trowel here and um, you see these prehistorically made out of clay just kind of a rounded flat surface and the junction kind of in here where uh, the base kind of meets the thing you start up that's what I'm going to take this rounded and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to tap it out and make it all smooth and I'm going to go all the way around until I do that and that just anneals it together that much more just kind of sticks it together really good. I don't know if you can see how well that does. Uh, okay, it just kind of smooths it right out on the inside of it. I'm going to go all the way around. really start to take shape. Then I'm going to take a paddle. And I use paddles for decoration, but I'm going to use just the plain size of the paddle here. And I'm just going to paddle all the lumps and bumps out of this. And this is where it really starts to clean up and look a whole lot better. Sometimes I'll go over a couple of times to get it all out of there. And all those little creases and stuff, I'll go back over and get that out with a rib. You can hardly see it starting to smooth up. Kind of take shape on it. same height all the way around is what I'm feeling for. And then I've got a little plastic rib. Prehistorically they would have probably used a cane knife or a piece of gourd. I'm going to put just a tiny bit of water on it. And I'm going to kind of just go back and smooth up. And you can see how nice and smooth it's becoming doing that. And I'll do this a couple of times after I go over the inside. I'll come back to the outside and do it again. And this just makes sure everything's stuck together really good. It starts to drag and put a little bit more water on it. And then the inside, you still have some roughness on the inside uh, of it. I'm going to go in and get that out next. I'm going to switch to the rounded area. And if it gets clay on there, you just want to keep wiping it off. Keep it clean. And 
this clay that I'm using, it's got naturally occurring sand, so it's considered sand tempered, but it's just naturally, it's not like you had to mix anything in it. It's just naturally occurring in the clay. And y'all get quite a bit of sand temper around uh, southern Alabama. just going in now and smoothing it up even more on the inside with it. Just put it all together good. The inside pretty much smoothed up. Now I'm going to go back to the outside and take the paddle to it one more time and smooth up the outside before I let it set. And you get like this little uh, ridge right here. You can just tap that right out. And go back around. Then I'm going to do the same thing, just kind of smooth it all the way up. So it's nice and smooth. It's almost like you're making yourself a, a nice canvas when you start incising and decorating it. Same thing over here. You can kind of see where it's kind of rump, lumpy and ridgy. Okay. Take that out of there. And do the same thing. Same thing here. The same thing here. Oops, got some dry clay on there. lab underneath the table here. If you hear any weird noises, it's coming from the dog. He's about 13. He's one of the sweetest boys you could ever have, but likes to be right with me. Just kind of even it back in there. And this is the point you just want to get it set where you want it to uh, set up. And what I'm doing is feeling where it's basically the same uh, level on both sides. Because once I get it set up, that's pretty much the shape it's going to stay in. And this is one of the hardest things to learn. Even for me now, if I'm uh, in a hurry, you got to know when to just let stuff set up and uh, go back and work on it. If it's too uh, limp and you're trying to do stuff to it, you're just going to end up uh, costing more time and effort than what it should. Or if you let it set up till it's kind of that waxy uh, consistency, they call it leather hard, but to me it's a little bit 
more than that. It's almost, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, compared to uh, like soap or something. It still gives a little bit, but not much. But that shape right there is pretty much going to be the Cazuela shape. And I'll let this set, and then I'll go back and trim the top of it off um, and get it ready to decorate on it. Um, but that's the basics on just construction. And basically, I call this blanking a pot out. Um, you get it to this point, and like I said, just let it sit. you got to have patience and wait for it to set up. Uh, but that didn't take long. I'm going to set it over here and let it just sit a little bit. Okay, here we go. I went ahead and cleaned up the top of it, trimmed it up and cleaned the rim up. And it's pretty, pretty stiff right now. I'll probably get it out of this bowl. Oh yeah, it's going to come out of the bowl. Just fine. And pretty much you could leave it plain, uh, like in the picture with the ladies. This is pretty much where they stopped. Uh, you can see here it's just a plain one. I could leave it like that. Um, a lot of the pots you get a little uh, punctate around the, the where the base kind of meets the neck of it. Um, some of them are just plain though, they don't. So this is kind of up to the artistic, this is where your artistic license comes in at. Um, I'm going to do a little punctate around this one. This is just a piece of river cane. And um, just on that juncture, I'm just going to kind of eyeball where that juncture comes in at and start putting the uh, little punt tapes in it all the way around. And you see this with basically all the southeastern tribes, Mississippian time period, uh, there's not designated tribes till European contact. But uh, you see that influence, um, it's almost like religions are now. But I would go all the way around with it and get that juncture all the way there. Um, if I wanted to incise on it. And incising is one way you can decorate pots. Like these little pots here are incised. This one's incised around the outside of it. I'll do that same type because it's fast and easy for demonstration. But all these are incised. It's just basically where you're scratching the design, the design in it. And this design here, you can just kind of eyeball it. Some of the designs you have to be a little bit more careful with. This is just basically V's. And then you fill them in. But that's it. You just uh, incise it on there. And that's uh, pretty much how you make a casuola. Then you let it get a little bit drier. And once it starts getting a little bit drier than this, it'll probably still polish though. Um, you can polish it and you just take a really smooth rock and it lines up all those little platelets in the clay and uh, we'll just polish it right up. I don't know if you can see where it's kind of dull here, if I can get enough of it on there, and where it shines up here. This could dry just a little bit more, but if I polish it now and go back and polish it, the more you polish it as it dries, the shinier it'll get. And you see all variations. Um, sometimes they polish the inside more than they do the outside, just to make it easier for cleaning them. You can kind of tell the difference there between there and the dullness over here. But this is just another, just like a river rock, you could pick up a, one of the good tumbled ones. Um, then you'd let it dry and uh, fire it. I'll set that out of the way. 
And for firing. For firing the pots, it just takes a campfire. Like I said, this is all free natural uh, resources we have plenty of here in Alabama. We've got plenty of clay, and this is just dead wood that falls down out of the trees. You don't have to have anything fancy um, at all with it. Um, pretty much you want to build an initial campfire. Let it die down to a good bed of coals where this has been burned off and dried really good. And so you just have the ash, and then the coals we put like a ring around where the coals are still hot. And then we've kind of preheated the pots around the outside of the fire um, as the fire was dying down to get the coals and the ash and stuff. And then we place the preheated pots inside that ring of fire. And we'll keep it kind of going like that for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. The pots are already pretty hot and preheated. From there, we'll start to kindle it back up. And we'll keep it at this stage for, I don't know, probably another 15, 20 minutes until the pots start to take on a little bit of color and they'll almost turn black just from the heat and the smoke. The clay's porous and it'll just absorb the smoke and turn them black. Um, when they start to take color, that blackness, you want to kind of scoop the fire in a little bit closer to them and go about 15, 20 minutes more. And then you really want to start building up the fire. And we had some uh, scrap lumber that we were using here. You can use anything. Prehistorically, it would have just been dead wood out of the trees. Usually nothing bigger than your wrist, nothing huge, but um, you want to keep it going. And then when they start to really turn black, which is like I say, 15, 20 minutes intervals on most of this, um, then you want to start really building up the fire. And it's better to fire at night because you can see the uh, glow of the pots and that's how you know basically they're done, is they will glow just like the coals. And if you're firing something like shell temper, um, you can overburn it, or limestone temper, you can overburn it. And this is the only way we found to gauge the temperature, is doing it at night and watching for the glow. And um, when you get it going and they really start to uh, take off, start really changing colors, the black will start to burn completely off. When that starts happening, you just want to pile wood all the way over the top of it. And by the time you get this going with the wood and stuff all the way over the top, this is when you usually start to see that faint glow. And then you just let it die down. And after it dies down and cools, then the pots are done. And they're fired. Uh, they'll hold water. You can cook in them. Just like they did prehistorically. And like I said, this is free resources. Free underused resources that are everywhere in Alabama. Some of the other... Uh, Decorating techniques that you'll see here too. This is a uh, Lamar uh, and pretty much it's uh, late Mississippi and proto-historic, but you get a lot of stamped and paddle pottery where they would basically paddle the design on with the pot as you build it. You just paddle the design right on it. And this one, like I was saying, is shell tempered, so it would have been more of a cooking pot. Perfect size for cooking too, but that's one decorating technique. Another decorating technique is painting. And in the South, you get colors from red to white and every shade in between. This is a reproduction from Arkansas. Um, and it's basically red mud and white mud. The clay is just kind of a buff color. Um, but then the, the paint down or the clay down to make kind of a, a paint, I guess what you'd call a slip in modern day and then you just paint it on there. Um, I like to do it while it's leather hard, kind of that waxy consistency, about like the pot that uh, I was just polishing on, and then kind of polish it down in there so it really sticks to it where it's not just caked on the top of it, but where it actually becomes part of the pot. Uh, but this is one of the decorating techniques too, and this one, like I said, it's from Arkansas, uh, Nodina culture. It's proto-historic, right at contact. Another uh, decorating technique is negative painting. And uh, clay by itself, um, if you don't have anything smoky around, it'll just fire with no smoke clouds or anything on it. 
but clay will, uh, it's porous and it'll absorb the carbon in about like you season an iron skillet, uh, how they turn black, and I know everybody cooks with iron skillets or has somebody in the family that has, but the black on the iron skillet is just carbon buildup out of the fire uh, that it, from the uh, cooking oils and everything that you're using when you cook, just that continuous buildup of it. On a pot, this one's a reproduction from the Nashville Basin, Tennessee um, area. Um, and basically, negative painting, what they do, they put clay really thick on a fired pot that didn't have hardly any smoke clouds on it. You paint clay really thick everywhere you don't want the smoke to be. Um, and that's where it comes with the negative painting. But you paint it on really thick everywhere you don't want the smoke to be. You put it back in a fire, get the smoke going, and um, get it hot enough to take the smoke. And then after it cools, you take it back out and you rinse it off and you get the negative painting. Now, in bright sunlight, and I've had this one out doing programs in bright sunlight, it will fade. And this is what you see in museums, too. You see this decoration, not this, this decoration, but this technique from Missouri all the way to Florida. Um, and we don't know how much of it's been lost because there's a whole lot of it that's faded off pots. And the black, I've got a little rabbit from Arkansas here. It's got black and that's just smoke out of the fire. Um, they had a lot of rattleheads. They're just kind of entertaining. I don't know if y'all can hear that or not. Um, that to me, some stuff is definitely ceremonial, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that is just almost silly, like you're entertaining the kids with it. And you see a lot of toys like that too. Uh, this is a reproduction. They call it a bear from Russell Cave National Monument. It could be a dog. Um, Okmogi has toys. Just about every site when you get into the collections, have toys um, that look, some of them look like the kids have made, some of them looks like somebody a little bit older had made. But I can just imagine, you know, sitting around making pottery and giving the kids or entertaining the kids, making them some little something and firing it, you know, and they've actually got a toy they can play with. This part I find really fascinating is the toys. And I've seen the minute little fingerprints on some of them. Wycliffe Mounds has a little owl toy. And on its little eyes, it's got little tiny, tiny like dimples for its eyes. But it looks like uh, they use like a baby fingerprint, the little fingerprints. And even where you see the lines in the fingerprints, they're so tiny and delicate. It just amazes me what all you can see prehistorically with it. Um, I've got a few more animal ones here. This one's from Arkansas, possum, shell tempered. Uh, you get possums and birds and frogs and Mythical creatures, I guess you could say with it. I guess this one here, Fort Walton Beach, it's definitely, I would say, a mythical creature. Uh, but you get a lot of just unusual designs, uh, just artistic. I mean, even modern to me, this would pass for modern art. Uh, it's just fabulous, all the different forms that you see. And it's all made just out of basic clay and mud out of the ground and firewood. I just, I don't know. It's one of my favorite things. As you can probably tell, I get excited about it. I enjoy it. And I encourage everybody to go play in the mud. Go try it. Uh, go explore. Definitely go to our Alabama archives um, and look at it. Uh, it's, it's amazing what we've got in Alabama. But thank you for listening. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank you.